Good evening and welcome to my How Healthy Are You weekly educational call. My name is Dr. Thomas Brewer. I'm a PhD chemist and I'm going to start off this week's call with a, a little bit of housekeeping type information. We are currently out of Steromax and we've been out of Steromax for about one week, maybe a little longer, but I expect it in this Friday. So uh, again, I'll be, I expect to receive quite a bit of Steromax this Friday. It was very strange that um, the parent company actually ran out of Steromax two years in a row. That's but there's been a lot of supply chain disruption as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, I've noticed many manufacturers are having supply chain problems um, as a result of the four-month shutdown that was essentially most of the world. Uh, another point, I keep getting this question about taking antibiotics. And antibiotics are commonly prescribed and sometimes, I mean, it's the only way to get over some sort of infection, especially ear infections and bladder infections. And the question comes up if someone's taking antibiotics and they feel they need to, uh, should they stop taking probiotics? The answer is yes. Do not take probiotics at the same time you're taking an antibiotic because they cancel each other out, so they will diminish each other. When you're finished with the antibiotic, by all means, get back on probiotics, and I recommend a double dose for the same number of days you took the antibiotic. I have a nice little video on this in YouTube, um, and it's under my name, Dr. Thomas Brewer, without the Las Vegas on the end. So it's just Dr. Thomas Brewer, and you'll see a video there called Probiotics versus Prebiotics, and uh, it goes into a lot of detail, and it, it's quite informative. So I suggest you take a look at it and uh, I've talked about that in the past, too. Uh, but for those of you that didn't know about it. And then what I want to talk about today is a way to combat air pollution and pollutants in our body with food. And normally I talk about my morning tonic system where you start your day with the warm lemon water and wait about 30 minutes and then take freshly squeezed celery juice um, and then wait 30 minutes and eat whatever you want. And that's very, very detoxifying for the body. But some people can't go through that process in the morning. The other way I previously told people to detox the body, especially metals and heavy metals, is just through having a cup of cilantro a day, which is just a handful of cilantro in your salad or straight, or even you can make a tea with it. And that's another convenient and easy way to detox the body, especially of heavy metal. Well, there's another way um, that seems to work best for people that are sensitive to air pollution. And so these would be people with potential lung issues like asthma or um, C, uh, COPD. So people like that, that are real sensitive to air pollution, there's something they can do, there's a food they can eat. So typically the, uh, you know, again, we'll be looking for a food that could detox us and detox carcinogens in air pollution. And a, Big one is diesel fumes, and, and there's benzene compounds in diesel fumes. And the whole goal is to decrease the resulting inflammation 
that occurs. And this is uh, an inflammatory immune response, very common and very dangerous. It, it leads to a number of health problems. Now, we already have lots of detoxifying enzymes in our liver and our airways, meaning our lungs. And the problem is some people have far less than others, and these are the people at risk. So some people, they'll naturally break down toxins that's found, that are found in air pollution, and they'll also be able to detoxify the toxins and preservatives we find in foods. So food preservatives are toxic, um, and they don't seem to have a problem, and their liver never gets that toxic. That's because they have a good quantity of detoxifying enzymes already in their body. Now, these aren't the digestive enzymes that people take. These are uh, some of the thousands of different enzymes that are in our bodies, and some of us have more than others based on genetics, and it's something we just have to live with and deal with and work around if we're one of those people that has fewer of these detoxifying enzymes. And the food is broccoli. Broccoli is just this remarkable superfood that will increase the activity of your detox enzymes. And these would be the detox enzymes that you would normally have in your liver or your lungs or other uh, airways, or bronchial tubes, things like that. The dosage is between one and two cups per day. And this effect is found with other cruciferous vegetables like cabbage and cauliflower, but broccoli was the best. And it's so good, there is a 20% uh, reduce, reduced or reduction in death rate from any inflammatory immune response from an air pollutant, which is extremely significant to reduce a death rate by 20% just by eating a food that's commonly available, and you can even buy it frozen in most any store. The other potential issue with broccoli consumption, since it reduces an inflammatory immune response, some people would conjecture that it could also interfere with your normal immune response when you want to fight off a cold or flu or any type of virus. And, and that's a big thing today is being able to fight off viruses. It's always been big in my book, but it, it seems to have gotten a lot more attention the past five months or so. And the answer is no. Broccoli does not interfere with our normal immune function, and this would be the immune function we need to destroy viruses. Uh, so broccoli consumption is very good for people with allergies or asthma or COPD um, in order to combat the effects of air pollution. And air pollution just seems to be getting worse and worse in fact, the, the one time it was pretty good was when we were shut down for a few months and there were fewer cars on the road. It seemed like the whole world uh, got a lot cleaner, but uh, it seems like we're ramping back up. So keep broccoli in your toolbox of information to combat the toxic effects of air pollution. Okay, so that's what I have for today. I'm going to open up the call to questions here. Here we go. So if you have a question, this would be the time to ask. Doctor, I have a question. Yeah. Regarding uh, the broccoli, is it best to have it raw or steamed? Or Right. So the broccoli is best raw, but it is somewhat hard to eat raw 
because it's very coarse and it can scratch your throat. So what was recommended was minimal cooking. So a light steaming was considered almost as good as raw, but it softens up the vegetable enough that it doesn't uh, irritate the throat. And that's a really, really good question because most of the time, all vegetables need to be consumed raw, but there are exceptions. One of them is asparagus. Cannot be eaten raw, must be eaten cooked. Um, and you, you do lose some antioxidant and enzymatic activity the more you cook vegetables. So minimal cooking is preferred with pretty much any vegetable um, if you just don't like eating them raw. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Did you have a question? Did you have a question? Do we have any other questions? I can hear somebody trying to think of a question. What's your opinion of coffee? My opinion on coffee? Yes. Was that the question? Yes. Yeah. There's quite a lot of good with respect to coffee. And the problems with coffee come when we consume too much of it and it starts affecting our brain. The caffeine in coffee is a very strong stimulant. And the half-life, which is the time it takes for half of the caffeine to break down, is six hours. So that means six hours after consuming coffee, you still got half the caffeine in your system. And that is balanced by the fact that the more coffee you consume, the greater your chances are to fight off cancer. So we, we get put in this dilemma. You need to drink a lot of coffee to get a, a, the anti-cancerous benefit. Um, but if you drink too much, it, it, there's a lot of me, uh, mental problems and that are going to result from consuming too much caffeine. My final outcome or, or my bottom line decision on coffee is if you like it, don't drink more than one to two cups a day. And that way you get the best of both worlds. The other thing about coffee is I have found that most people that drink coffee, not everyone, most people don't like coffee. So what they do is they put a lot of additives in it. And so basically they've just made a coffee-flavored dessert. Uh, but whatever they're consuming hardly resembles coffee. And that is more of a detriment than anything. It, it's not that the coffee is an issue. It's the additives people put in it. Uh, as an example, these non-dairy creamers are extremely bad for us, and they have the worst ingredient list you could possibly imagine. If, if you look at Dr. Oz's top five bad ingredients, four of them are the first four ingredients in coffee creamers. And that makes coffee very bad for us. It's far better to use a high fat dairy product like cream or whipping cream or half and half or full fat milk than these creamers. And, and that should make some people feel good because they probably like those better anyway. Uh, but the ultimate way to drink coffee, if you really like coffee, is to get high-quality beans, grind them fresh, and drink the coffee black. You will be shocked at how good it is 
um, when you buy high quality beans and grind them within one minute of brewing. I, I wouldn't let the ground coffee uh, sit more than 60 seconds before it gets hit with hot water. And you'll find a big difference in flavor and you won't need to put additives in it. So coffee is a, a real complicated topic because there are antioxidants in it. There's phytochemicals in coffee. Coffee is somewhat nutritious. The dilemma is the caffeine. If you remove the caffeine from coffee, you solve one problem and start another because the chemical necessary to remove caffeine from coffee is most 99% of the time done when the coffee's already ground. It's not done from the bean uh, because it'd be very difficult to soak inside the bean. So the coffee's ground and then it's hit with a chemical that will extract the caffeine, but then there's a residue. So you, you're substituting caffeine for the decaffeinating chemical. So I am not a big proponent of decaffeinated coffee. If you can't have, handle the caffeine, don't drink coffee unless you, you're really desperate uh, for the flavor. Um, so it, it's a complicated topic talking about coffee. It's, uh, I mean, people write articles on this all the time. Best ways to brew it, best ways to buy it, uh, best countries to grow it, best soil, best elevation, um, and, and best ways to drink it, and benefits of drinking it, and all of that. So I hope that answered you, your question without introducing multiple follow-up questions because it's uh, somewhat a complicated topic. Okay. Do we have any other questions? If not, that's fine. I'll end the call here, and I'll be doing another conference call next Wednesday, same time. So until then, uh, stay healthy. Okay. Good night, everybody. Good night.